Good evening. I'm Dr. Rick Peters, president of the Boston Medical Library, and I would like to welcome you to this Zoom presentation of our 18th annual Estes Lecture. The Boston Medical Library was refounded in 1875 by physicians including Dr. Henry Ingersoll Bowditch, an internist and public health pioneer, Dr. James Reed Chadwick, a gynecologist and first librarian, and Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the first president, to be a public library to make books and journals accessible to the practicing physician. It evolved to have a large collection of antique medical books, including ancient manuscripts and hundreds of incunabula, which are books printed in Europe before 1500. In 1960, an alliance was signed with the Harvard Medical Library, and the BML moved into the new Countway Library. The BML is now entering a new future. One important element of this transformation for BML is a new alliance with the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. Effective immediately, UMass Chan will provide library services for BML fellows and for members of the Massachusetts Medical Society while offering those fellows and members access to UMass Chan's resources. Planning for the care of the historic collections is ongoing. I encourage you to visit the BML's new website, bml.org, for more information. <clears throat> and I invite you to become a fellow of the Boston Medical Library. J. Worth Estes was a professor of pharmacology at Boston University School of Medicine, as well as an accomplished medical historian, serving as editor of the Journal of Medical, uh, the Journey of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, as well as writing several books and numerous articles. This uh, uh, lecture was established to honor his memory. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the Estes Selection Committee for their help in developing ideas for this lecture. <clears throat> Please write your questions in the chat function. Uh, which uh, we will answer after the lecture. Um, and now, Dr. Katie Peeler, a member of the Estes Lecture Committee and a trustee of the Boston Medical Library will introduce our speaker. Katie? Hi, thanks so much, Rick. So at the turn of the 20th century, a great wave of smallpox epidemics swept across the United States, spurring the growth of modern public health authorities and engendering widespread resistance to the government policy of compulsory vaccination. In the 2022 Estes lecture, Dr. Wilrich will revisit this long forgotten episode and offer some historical reflections on the politics of vaccine mandates in the era of COVID-19. Michael Wilrich is the Left Families Professor of History at Brandeis University. His scholarship centers on the social, legal, and political history of the United States since the Civil War. He is especially interested in how ordinary people experienced, tangled with, and shaped the increasingly powerful interventionist state that emerged with the rise of the new urban industrial society around the turn of the 20th century. Professor Wilrich received his AB from Yale and his PhD from the University of Chicago. His first book, City of Courts, Socializing Justice in Progressive Air Chicago, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2003, won the John H. Dunning Prize, awarded by the American Historical Association and the William Nelson Cromwell Foundation Book Prize from the American Society for Legal History. His second book, Pox, An American History, published by Penguin in 2011, won the Lawrence W. Levine Prize for the best book in American cultural history, awarded by the Organization of the American Historians and the William H. Welch Medal from the American Association for the History of Medicine. Pox was also named a New Yorker favorite book for 2011 and a finalist for the Mark Linton History Prize. Currently, Professor Wilbridge is writing a book about anarchism and the rise of the American surveillance state. A 2015 Guggenheim Fellow, Professor Wilbridge's work has been supported by fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Newbury Library, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Mellon Foundation, and the Mandel Center for the Humanities. Professor Wilbridge is president of the American Society for Legal History. His talk tonight is entitled Vaccine Mandates in Historical Perspective, Lessons from the Last Great American Smallpox Epidemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
<clears throat> uh, well, thanks everyone for uh, coming out. Uh, my screen should now be sharing. You should be seeing my uh, slideshow. Somebody shout if, if you're not. Um, I first, first off, just want to thank uh, Dr. Peeler for that wonderful introduction and Dr. Peters uh, for uh, uh, running this event tonight uh, and the entire selection committee of the, uh, for the Estes lecture. It's a real honor for me to be asked to uh, present tonight, um, especially because I've always considered myself something of an interloper in the field of the history of medicine. I really came to it through my interest in social and legal history. Uh, and as I was examining um, legal controversies that attended the rise of a modern administrative and welfare state in the early 20th century, um, the struggle over compulsory vaccination really became the most salient of all of these different kinds of struggles uh, and, uh, and led me to uh, write the book that I did, Pox. Um, so that's what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Well, as everybody, everybody on this call uh, tonight knows, um, American society during the past two years has uh, been deeply, in fact, uh, astonishingly divided over public health, over both uh, vaccine mandates and mask mandates and isolation orders and the like. Um, but make no mistake, the power to impose such mandates, especially during a deadly epidemic, is deeply rooted in American legal, constitutional, and political traditions going back to the founding. But here is the, part, here is the hard part of the story. So is the resistance. Anti-vaccinationism and vaccine hesitancy are as old as vaccination itself. And the United States has a particularly robust history of popular resistance to public health mandates of all kinds. In the early 20th century, after the uh, wave of smallpox epidemics that I'm going to talk about uh, tonight, one of the leading health officials in the United States lamented that America was, quote, the least vaccinated of any civilized country. Now, we certainly wouldn't use that term civilized in the same way today, uh, but his own frustration, I think, uh, is reflected again today in, the, in, the, um, in our political moment about the uh, massive resistance to uh, mandates of all kinds during the COVID epidemic. So tonight I'm gonna to talk a bit about smallpox uh, and the, uh, the vaccination question of the early 20th century. And then I'm gonna reflect a bit about um, our current uh, predicament, uh, the, the dynamics of power and resistance in our own era of COVID-19. So this talk uh, draws upon my book, Pox in American History. Um, pox is the first history of the wave of smallpox epidemics that struck the United States in the years around the turn of the 20th century, spurring the growth of modern public health authority and engendering widespread social and legal opposition to the government policy of compulsory vaccination. The book traces the journey of smallpox across an increasingly interconnected American landscape from Southern sharecropping settlements to Northern industrial centers, from the nation's capital to Filipino and Puerto Rican villages at the farthest edges of the new American empire. Pac shows how health officials across America grappled with the medical mysteries of these epidemics, how vaccine manufacturers in a vast unregulated industry vied for market share and by doing so, risked lives by distributing tainted vaccines. And why so many Americans responded to a policy that many of us, not most, not all of us, but most of us take for granted today, compulsory immunization, with a sense that their constitutional rights had been violated, their liberties infringed, and their bodies invaded. More broadly, Pox uses this vaccination question as contemporaries called the debate, to examine the waves of social upheaval, popular protest, and litigation that attended the rise of a powerful state in America and shaped the contours that that state assumed in the 20th century. Now, um, I don't 
uh, assume that you all, uh, as I do, spend most of your time thinking about the progressive era. Uh, the progressive era is, I'll say a few, just a few words about it to put you in the historical moment in the proper context. Um, the progressive era uh, is the historian's term for uh, the period uh, from the 1890s through World War I. And it's really the period when uh, the United States, uh, a nation of about 75 million people, became modern. Um, this uh, photograph from the period of a uh, man looking down upon Andrew Carnegie's homestead steel plant in uh, near Pittsburgh um, is meant to convey the the way in which the sort of liberal individual of the 19th century confronted and, and tried to come to terms with the changing scale of social and economic and political life uh, in uh, the age of carbon, carboniferous capitalism. So industrialization is one of the signature features of this period. This is the, the, the period when the United States uh, became the world's most productive industrial um, economy. It's a period of mass immigration to the United States with a million immigrants coming to the country each year. Um, and from uh, new places, uh, uh, from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and these new immigrants as they came in were viewed with considerable uh, suspicion by old stock uh, native born Americans uh, from uh, Western and Northern Europe uh, and were treated uh, by eugenicist thinkers as members of distinct races. Um, this is also a period of high urbanization, um, by the end of the period, a majority of Americans will be recorded by the Census Bureau as living in urban places. That's a, just a stunning transformation in a period of about 30 years. Um, it was also famously an age of progressive reform movements. That's how uh, the, the era got its name. Um, as a range of different social groups uh, tried to use a uh, new professional knowledge, including law and social science, and yes, medicine, uh, to build a new kind of state, a state capable of uh, ameliorating the worst effects of industrial capitalism. And many of the new measures put in place during this period, measures ranging from uh, milk regulations and workers' compensation laws and hours and wages lim uh, uh, hours limits and wage minimum wages for industrial workers. Many of these new laws were uh, justified to the public as uh, measures bearing upon the public health. Um, and of course, there was compulsory vaccination, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, there's my stop share button. I'm gonna look at y'all for a minute, wish I could. Um, other key developments during this period that really shaped the context were uh, the expanding American empire. The way in which this, uh, the United States in, in the Spanish-American War of 1898 and the, the ensuing Philippine-American War uh, from 1899 uh, to 1902 um, really uh, made the, the United States a colonizing power. And this was, was admitted uh, to uh, by American leaders at the time that as, as William Howard Taft told a, a group of, of uh, Philadelphia physicians in 1911, the United States had become a colonizing and colony holding people, uh, which really was, was, was quite a departure from the American tradition, at least as Americans, uh, American mythology uh, would have it. And this was, of course, a violent, a violent process. Um, and American leaders rationalized this process by, by saying that Americans were delivering the blessings of liberty and quote unquote civilization um, to corners of the earth. Um, and among those blessings of liberty were public health and sanitation projects uh, that were developed during, in a context of war against uh, a uh, insurrectionary uh, domestic uh, uh, population. Race and racism, the last sort of factor I really wanna, wanna include here in this context, hugely important. The progressive era is really the period when Jim Crow becomes formalized, legalized, institutionalized um, across the South. Jim Crow um, 
establishing racial apartheid in all areas of uh, Southern life from education to transportation to yes, medicine. So when the smallpox epidemics began breaking out first in the South uh, in 1898 and then spreading to the, the Midwest and then eventually all across the US after the turn of the turn of the century, all of those historical trends I've just mentioned shaped how the American people um, understood and experienced the disease and also how they understood and experienced public health interventions. So it really shaped the, uh, their response to compulsory vaccination. So let me bring back my, my slides for a moment here. Okay. So let me say a few words about smallpox because it really is a distinctive disease um, and uh, uh, absolutely stunning and fascinating to study. Um, smallpox was the deadliest disease in human history. In a, human, in a uh, typical outbreak, the disease killed 25 to 30% of all the people it infected. Smallpox is estimated to have killed 300 million people worldwide in the 20th century alone. But smallpox enjoys another distinction. It is the only contagious disease ever to be completely eradicated from the human species. And as everybody uh, here tonight knows, vaccination was absolutely crucial to that victory. Um, with each passing year, there are fewer and fewer people alive who have ever seen a case of smallpox. Uh, and that includes doctors and epidemiologists. Um, so I wanted to say a few words about what smallpox was like. Um, smallpox was caused uh, by a brick-shaped uh, virus. Um, this is a single virion of the uh, of variola major of the smallpox virus, um, which is a you know, protein casing um, enclosing uh, DNA. Um, smallpox was highly contagious. It could be spread like a common cold uh, from person to person uh, or by virus particles on blankets and clothes. Um, there was no animal or insect vector for this disease. It had to be transmitted from human to human. Um, the incubation period of smallpox lasted a very long time. I know in, with COVID, uh, there's, there's estimates of sort of the range. It can range from two to 14 days. For, for, um, for smallpox, uh, the typical incubation period was more like 10 to 14 days. And in a world that in which um, uh, people were moving about in unprecedented numbers and at unprecedented speeds. This meant that somebody could, an immigrant could leave uh, uh, rural Italy, um, catch a boat, a uh, steamship from Naples and make it to, um, uh, to uh, uh, Ellis Island without presenting any symptoms and yet be, still be incubating smallpox uh, in uh, his or her body. Um, the, after the incubation period, the first symptoms were very much like a flu-like experience with a severe back pain, vomiting, uh, high fever. And then the fever would, uh, would, would very um, commonly sort of dissipate. And that's when the uh, rash began to form and become visible. Uh, a, a rash so horrible that uh, the medical literature of the period calls it the eruption. Um, eventually, the, the uh, uh, smallpox would attack the internal organs, and death would usually, usually be caused by respiratory failure. Um, most survivors who survived uh, smallpox were scarred for life, uh, as was this man from who survived the Cleveland epidemic of 1901 to 1902. Uh, many people were left blind uh, from smallpox. Uh, the one uh, virtue or the one uh, gift from experience of smallpox was that you could never get it again. You could only get smallpox once. So that was smallpox. As people uh, in, uh, in, in world history had known it for millennia. But the turn of the century epidemics into the United States brought with them a medical mystery. From 1898 to 1903, hundreds of thousands of Americans were infected with smallpox. We, we really don't have reliable statistics. 
uh, for the period, but but that's a that's a decent guess. Um, but fewer than about 10,000 Americans died. How could this be? Well, we now know, we now understand that this was really the first appearance, marked the first appearances of variola minor, a new form of smallpox in the United States. The first cases of this new so-called mild type of smallpox were reported uh, in Florida in 1896. Um, the uh, course of the disease was much less severe in most people, and it killed only, and I put that in quotation marks, about 1% of people whom it infected. With better medical care, the case fatality rate uh, may well have been uh, considerably lower. Now, the new form of, the, of smallpox caused itself all kinds of confusion, confusion within the medical profession and confusion among ordinary people who were told by health officials that smallpox had broken out in their community, they have to uh, quarantine, they have to get vaccinated and so on. And they responded that, I, this isn't smallpox, I've seen worse, right? Um, this did not match their expectations of what smallpox was. At the same time, epidemics of classical lethal smallpox struck many places, including Boston, uh, where 270 people died of, of variola major. Um, in New Orleans, 500 people died. In Philadelphia, 400 people died. In New York, uh, 730 people died uh, during these epidemics right after the turn of the century. Now, health officials had a powerful weapon against smallpox, one that was at that time already 100 years old. And of course, I'm speaking of vaccination. Uh, and this print, uh, which is quite lovely, I think, really tells the whole sort of uh, story of the invention of, of uh, smallpox vaccine, the way um, a country doctor, um, uh, Edward Jenner in England, um, and, and others like him noticed that uh, uh, milkmaids in rural areas had uh, developed cowpox on their hands, uh, but they, that is a, 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 a virus from uh, from the from uh, cows, um, but they uh, seem to be uh, protected against smallpox, the much deadlier, much more serious disease. And this really led to the development of vaccines. A um, hundred years later, in in uh, the United States and in Puerto Rico. Vaccines were being harvested in much the same way from the bellies, from uh, cowpox sores, oozing uh, sort of clear lymph, kind of like pus uh, uh, from the bottom of, of calves and just harvesting it right onto, in this case, vaccine points uh, or in the uh, more modern laboratory settings that were developed by pharmaceutical companies like Park Davis and Company of, of Detroit, um, in a combination of the stable and the laboratory. Uh, so the, the products of the stable would, would be brought into a laboratory setting uh, in which um, uh, they would be um, uh, 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 you know, treated a bit with uh, 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 glycerin uh, in order to um, both uh, stabilize uh, the vaccine and, and, and hopefully um, make it safer. Um, vaccination itself uh, was done in a way that's very different from how we're uh, used to vaccines today. Um, it was not done but through a simple shot in a doctor's office or in a vaccination uh, facility, but was done very often in the open air uh, in large scale public vaccinations um, in which the doctor, a doctor or health officer would uh, first score the uh, arm of the uh, person receiving the vaccine, scrape it with this uh, uh, sort of scary looking tool there, which is actually called a scarifier, uh, and then dab on some live uh, vaccine from uh, either a, a, a point, an ivory point, or from um, some other um, little tip to, to dab it onto the skin, after which, um, over time, there would there would form a, um, a vesicle at the site, uh, and that would eventually produce a scar at the site of the of, of uh, the vaccination. 
and and people of a certain age still have their vaccination scars um, that they can uh, roll up their sleeves and sh and show you. Um, and in a pinch, uh, vaccine um, or, or public health workers uh, could check a scar and and tell if it was. Uh, you know, fresh if it was in the, within the past several years, uh, and therefore the person was protected against smallpox. Okay, let me stop my uh, share for a minute. Um, all right, so um, health officials in responding to these epidemics not only had this powerful medical tech technology uh, vaccine, uh, but they also had political power, real political power. And their power, especially at the state level and the local level of government, uh, was grounded in the legal tradition of the police power. That is the, the broad authority of the state under the common law and the U.S. Constitution and the state constitutions to regulate individual liberty and property rights whenever the public welfare demands it. A long tradition in American ju uh, jurisprudence and constitutional law held that when the state flexed its, flexed its muscles under the police power, there was little anyone could do about it. Individual liberty must always yield to the greater good. And in this long legal tradition of the police power, public health was always the easiest case, um, especially when, it, when, it was, when there was an epidemic uh, that threatened a community. Um, the, as I mentioned, the police power tradition, that, that reservoir of sovereign power, uh, was traditionally understood to reside in local and state governments. Um, so federalism is very important to the history of public health. Um, with the police power being fundamentally state and local power, the federal government really had its greatest power in the area of public health at the edges, you know, in the, in the Western territories or at the borders or uh, overseas uh, in um, occupied uh, uh, possessions. Let's bring back my slides here one moment. Okay, well, uh, as I've said, um, this wave of smallpox uh, uh, epidemics begins in the 18, late 1890s as reported uh, uh, in the South uh, and it really kind of rages through Southern communities in 1898 and 1899, and then moves up uh, into the Midwest. Um, and then by, by uh, 1901, it's really quite generally prevalent across the United States. Um, local, state, and federal health officials enforced vaccination aggressively, sometimes using force at the nation's borders, along its railroad lines and in its public schools, factories, and tenement districts. And let me just give you a few pictures of, of this. That is now one of the major uh, foci of uh, immunization sort of interventions is in the public schools, in the schools generally now back then in the public schools. Um, so this is a picture of a uh, first a, a vaccination certificate a uh, certificate of vaccination signed by a, a family doctor or a member of the Department of Health in the city of New York that would entitle uh, its holder to um, enter uh, the public um, schools. Now, the picture on the right shows says something about the limitations of those certificates. Health officials uh, based at schools uh, became increasingly concerned that parents were, were uh, sending their children in with phony vaccination certificates. Um, and so they would uh, very often require, as this um, official is, uh, the children to roll up their sleeves and show the evidence that they've had a successful recent vaccination. And you can see on their left arms that each of these uh, boys has a, a vaccination scar. Children were a major part of the uh, argument for uh, compulsory vaccination, <clears throat> as this uh, 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 photograph from William M. Welch and J.F. Schamberg's Acute Contagious Diseases, a medical treatise published in Philadelphia from 1905, really underscores, right? Um, the child in the center, <clears throat> according to the, uh, the text of this book, uh, was unvaccinated while the other two 
children who are members of the same family had been vaccinated a year before because of the school vaccination requirements. Both sides of the vaccination debate uh, really politicized children's bodies. Um, but I have to say that this is a, you know, a very powerful um, argument right here in this single plate. Vaccinations were carried out in tenements, in uh, workplaces. Uh, they were carried out in criminal court buildings uh, like this one here um, in New York. In big cities like uh, Boston and New York and Chicago, um, public health departments would mobilize teams of vaccinators uh, who would go into uh, poorer areas of the city, into, into tenement districts um, and the like, uh, and in the, with, with police escort, go door to door, cordon off a neighborhood, go door to door, and knock on the doors, inspect the, the people living within, see if there were any um, smallpox cases broken out in the home, uh, remove uh, infected children from their families if necessary or if they deemed it necessary, uh, uh, inspect people for, for recent vaccination scars. And if people uh, lacked evidence of a recent vaccination, insist that they were vaccinated on the, on the spot. And I found many, many examples in American newspapers and even in some public health reports of vaccination being carried out uh, using physical force. Uh, this is a, a picture from the Boston Globe, really illustrating the kind of range of, of experiences that Bostonians might have with vaccinators during this period. Uh, and there's several examples of um, kind of open resistance here or demanding to see credentials of vaccinators coming into South Boston. The federal government uh, used the power that it had, which is really power at the edges, to um, uh, enforce compulsory vaccination during these epidemics uh, at the borders, there was there were there were inspections of uh, incoming steamships with immigrants on them, inspecting them for smallpox, demanding to see proof of vaccination when when smallpox was found uh, to be present aboard a steamship. The the entire uh, population of the steerage class, uh, though not the first class passengers, would be brought to. Uh, Hoffman Island out of New York Harbor in quarantine. Um, in um, the uh, new colonial spaces opened up by the uh, Spanish-American War and the Philippine-American War, uh, uh, U.S. Army medical personnel got very involved in enforcing compulsory vaccination among uh, the indigenous peoples. Uh, and um, this was often, uh, often carried out at force uh, by force. Uh, by force, um, especially in the Philippines. Um, there was also the U.S. Marine Hospital Service, which I became completely fascinated with in my, in my research. This is the origins of the Federal Public Health Service. Um, and they could go in whenever a local community or a state government uh, requested them to come in and help bring an ap epidemic into check. Uh, C.P. Wardenbaker, was their, their most prominent smallpox ec expert. And he went from town to town in these sort of little whistle stop places across the South, delivering vaccine and trying to persuade people to get vaccinated. Sometimes he did use coercion and got the local uh, sort of posse comitatus together to, to enforce vaccination. But over time, he increasingly came to rely on persuasion. And he would make the argument in the public square uh, for why vaccination uh, was important, why it was safe, why it mattered, and show how it worked. Okay, so resistance. The turn of the century vaccination campaigns triggered massive resistance. And, and what I would argue is one of the most important uh, and long forgotten civil liberty struggles of the 20th century. It's important always when talking about anti-vaxxers, right, to really realize that uh, people who are vaccine hesitant are not necessarily anti-vaxxers, right? Um, we, it's, it's too simple to view uh, people who have concerns about vaccination and, and, and have 
deep concerns about compulsory vaccination, it's too easy to see them in monolithic terms. We really need to sort of sort out uh, people to understand their uh, rationale and where they're coming from. Um, there was uh, in the early 20th century as today, a uh, anti-vaccination movement um, with recognizable uh, leaders. Many of them were physicians, in fact, physicians who practiced alternative forms of medicine that were increasingly marginalized with the rise of state licensing um, of the medical profession in America. Um, and they, uh, anti-vaccinationists, the sort of ideologically committed anti-vaccinationists produced uh, a literature, they produced their own contribution to a transatlantic literature of anti-vaccinationism, uh, really uh, probably my favorite of the anti-vaccinationist um, activists was Laura C. Little, um, who, cre who from uh, her home in uh, Minnesota crusaded not only against uh, compulsory vaccination, but also against eugenical sterilization laws, which were being uh, enacted um, roughly at about the, about the same time. Um, and Laura Little also produced this uh, kind of amazing document, Crimes of the Cowpox Ring, in which she had gone and done library research, looking at newspapers and communities across the country and found examples of, of newspaper stories where uh, it seemed that vaccination had led to uh, somebody to be sick or even led to a fatality. Um, and she pulled all of these together into an argument against the, um, you know, callous public health officials and their and their crass alliance with vaccine manufacturers. Um, but th these are a couple of examples of, uh, you know, anti-vaccinationist uh, pamphlets uh, produced by uh, committed leaders who are part of a movement that um, tried to overturn vaccination laws in state houses that funded litigation against uh, uh, health officials or against compulsory vaccination orders um, and um, who ran uh, uh, like-minded people for local school boards um, and so on. Now, um, everyday resistance had an entirely different character, right? So um, people experienced public health officials coming into their communities uh, during epidemics uh, in, a, in the most immediate way. Um, so the folks pictured in this picture from Milwaukee in the 1890s um, and similar scenes uh, taking place in New York City in 1901 or Boston in 1901, 1902 um, are not scenes in which you know, committed, ideologically committed anti-vaccinationists are engaging in you know fighting with the police these are much more immediate moments where um uh in this case a mother is trying to um to keep her child from being hauled off to an isolation hospital um these kinds of scenes uh took place uh quite um uh, quite often uh during these epidemics um so ordinary people rioted in the tenements and the streets and at factories against compulsory vaccination they forged vaccination certificates so their unvaccinated children could attend school they hid infected family members from the public health authorities and police to prevent them from being hauled off to the local pest house some even forged vaccination scars so let me just talk for a minute about why. What were some of the different rationales um, that people had? What motivated people to, um, to put up such a kick, as contemporary doctors called it, against vaccination? Because opponents of compulsory vaccination at the time were dismissed as cranks, right? As, as, um, or worse, as ignorant people who didn't understand the science um, and were uh, uh, selfish and uh, didn't know what was best for their children and so on. But in fact, the vaccine anti-vaccination literature is filled with sort of principled objections to public power and medical authority, to demands that medical authority be made more democratic. There are arguments that would be familiar to us today about uh, uh, personal control of the body, about the uh, people wanting the authority of their own, the paternal rights to protect their own children. Uh, there are arguments grounded in, in claims to religious freedom um, and so on. 
Different groups of Americans had specific reasons for opposing compulsory vaccination. Workers, uh, folks who worked with their hands, were very uh, concerned about the loss of work days and thus the loss of wages that would uh, frequently uh, occur after a vaccination, right? Which produced sore arms. Um, African Americans, Black Americans, uh, were deeply suspicious of white medical authorities and public health officials of the period were overwhelmingly white. Uh, folks who had ignored them during times of medical need now suddenly showing great interest in their community and insisting that they get vaccinated on demand. Christian scientists raised religious objections. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, uh, physicians practicing older forms of alternative medicine uh, viewed this all as one big conspiracy uh, with the uh, regulators of their profession. Also, the, the arrival of a new and milder variant of smallpox in, during these epidemics really confused everything, as public health officials insisted that compulsory vaccination was absolutely essential to keep this wave of milder smallpox from reverting to something much more serious. Um, and ordinary people uh, really viewed uh, smallpox vaccine as more dangerous to their health than, um, than uh, smallpox, or whatever they were calling smallpox, right, during these epidemics. Um, the risks were, in fact, occasionally uh, were, could be very, very serious, right? Um, so the, the, and the most extreme example from this period <clears throat> in Camden, New Jersey, nine school children died of tetanus, of lockjaw, as they called it during the period, um, following uh, uh, being vaccinated under compulsory vaccination orders. And there was a huge public investigation of this. Uh, and eventually the most sort of credible argument was that in fact, it, uh, the children had gotten tetanus from a, uh, a, a, a vaccine produced right across the river from Camden. In, in Philadelphia. The crisis in Camden pointed up the fundamental contradiction of American public health law at the turn of the century. The government ordered the public to get vaccinated, but did almost nothing to ensure that the vaccines or the, on the commercial vaccine market were safe and effective. There was no system of regulation. And this Camden event really changed things, galvanizing the anti-vaccination movement, um, causing medical societies to start to talk seriously about the need for a system of government regulation of vaccines. Some folks even called for turning vaccine production into a government monopoly. But as you could guess, uh, this idea was ruled out as too socialistic. Finally, in 1902, Congress acted to restore public co confidence in the vaccine supply by passing the Biologics Control Act, which set up the first system for national, uh, a national system for licensing and inspection of vaccines. Now, as all of us uh, for, who live in Massachusetts know, uh, Massachusetts played a major part in this story. Um, I deliberately not focused on that tonight uh, in order to bring out some of the less familiar details, but I, I can't not say a few words about Pastor Henning Jacobson, uh, a Swedish Lutheran minister in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who was was asked by his, the, the chairman of the local board of health in Cambridge to get vaccinated and refused. Um, he cited um, his, his own experiences with smallpox vaccine as a child, which had made him quite sick, and he said that his children, one of his children as well, had had a very serious adverse reaction. Uh, as his case uh, against the state of Massachusetts and its compulsory vaccination law it worked its way up in the courts, his arguments and those of his lawyers got more and more uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, deepened uh, with some of the inflections of the of the contemporary uh, anti-vaccination movement. He argued that his liberty was invaded when the state subject to, subjected him to penalties for neglecting to submit to vaccination, that a compulsory vaccination law is unreasonable, arbitrary, and oppressive, and therefore hostile 
to the inherent right of every freeman to carry for his own body and health in such a way uh, as to him seems best. We really recognize these arguments as, um, as having a real staying power uh, today. The Supreme Court said, no, uh, uh, we, uh, we can't accept this. The liberty secured by the Constitution of the United States to every person within its jurisdiction does not import an absolute right in each person to be at all times and in all circumstances wholly freed from restraint. There are manifold restraints to which every person is necessarily subject for the common good. On any other basis, organized society could not exist with safety to its members. Society based on the rule that each one is a law unto himself would soon be confronted with disorder and anarchy. And then Justice John Marshall Harlan compared this right to protect the um, community from an epidemic of smallpox to the right of, of a state to protect its community against an invasion, a military invasion. Um, Harlan did recognize certain limits that the police power of the state um, could be exercised in ways that were so arbitrary and oppressive in particular cases as to justify the interference of the courts to prevent wrong and oppression. And in fact, the courts during this period in a whole wave of litigation around compulsory vaccination uh, did create several uh, kind of limitations on state power, several safeguards for individual liberty. This case, like as often happens with cases um, that uh, have their origins in a big public emergency, this case was decided in 1905. And by that time, the epidemics, the wave of epidemics had really ended uh, in uh, America. And, and, the, and smallpox would disappear from the United States by the last reported case was 1949. Um, and uh, smallpox was eradicated worldwide by uh, 1980. So I want to jump ahead now to um, our current uh, COVID moment and just say, offer a few reflections on this moment, just, just a couple. Um, for a historian who wrote the book I've just described, um, the past two years have just brought a real sense of, of deja vu, as you, as you might imagine. Um, just the extent of uh, of uh, social uh, protest and public opposition uh, to um, uh, measures, whether they be vaccine mandates or lockdowns or, um, or um, uh, mask mandates in particular. Um, and the language used to, to explain uh, that opposition was so uh, familiar to me, um, the language of uh, you know, this sort of, uh, neoliberal conceptions of the self and the, the body being invaded and, and just a whole lot of anti-government uh, sentiment expressed through this crisis. Um, but I've also been impressed perhaps even more by the discontinuities. And let me just say a few words about the discontinuities, the ways that, that our current moment is different. First, the public health field is so much more progressive today than it was a century earlier. That practitioners are so concerned about problems of systemic racism and class bias. And they have sought during this pandemic to win support for vaccination through persuasion rather than coercion. The role of the federal government has been far more expansive during this period from funding vaccine production and re research and production uh, to the Biden administration's truly sweeping vaccine mandates for healthcare workers and businesses that employ a uh, hundred or more employees. Nothing like that would have been even imagined a century earlier. Uh, another aspect of this that this pandemic, and, I, and I'm sorry if this uh, this photograph triggers you as it sort of does me, but another uh, aspect of this pandemic that's just been really striking is how some of the strongest opposition to public health, to a public health response, has come from the state itself or from within the state itself, from actors within the state. So here, of course, uh, Donald Trump and his 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 his. Uh, you know, his attitude towards uh, Anthony Fauci, 
Uh, but we've seen similar things happen at the state levels as governors sort of uh, uh, with, with political ambitions to higher office uh, really uh, take on um, the pub, their own public health establishments. Um, the context for all of this, of course, is a much more partisan, hyper-partisan uh, divided nation. Um, and the way in which our um, levels of vaccination uptake uh, map onto the uh, voting, uh, the, the, the state by state uh, voting record in the 2020 election is really, really striking. So on the, on the, in the picture on your left, uh, the, um, the states in, in green are all sort of at or above uh, you know, are well vaccinated relative compared to the nation. Uh, and, um, and you can see that those states are, are almost uh, exclusively blue, uh, blue states. Um, the, the, uh, our um, legacies of the, of the past several uh, election cycles have in the way that uh, the American, American society has become so polarized by political party is really evident through uh, the way that we've uh, seen Americans respond to this epidemic. The courts uh, have, have really just begun to get involved. Uh, the Supreme Court handed the Biden administration a, a sort of mixed set of rulings, um, uh, issuing a stay against the OSHA um, uh, vaccine mandate for employers with more than 100 employees or 100 or more employees. And in Biden versus Missouri, the court um, uh, uh, overturned a stay against the, um, the measure requiring healthcare workers and in institutions receiving Medicare and Medicaid um, to be vaccinated against COVID. And the litigation is uh, small, is far from over. So I'm gonna end but with just a couple of words. At the end of World War II, Winston Churchill famously said, never let a good crisis go to waste. He was uh, making the case for the United Nations um, and, as, a, as, a, as a really important outcome of the settle peace settlement. For all of their social conflict and political contention, the smallpox epidemics of the early 20th century did leave behind several positive legacies. The Biologics Control Act, which made vaccines safer, Decisions like the Jacobson case, which clarified the public health authority of the states while introducing some new safeguards for individuals. Um, and the transformation in the thinking of some public health officers who moved away from police power to persuasion as, the, as their preferred method for uh, getting people vaccinated. So as the COVID-19 pandemic enters its third year, I think it's a good time for us to ask ourselves and our political leaders, what do we want the legacies of this pandemic to be? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have time for a few, a couple of questions. If anybody wants to uh, enter, put, enter a question in the chat. So far we have one. How did uh, physicians or clinicians at the time feel about treating or not treating uh, people who refused vaccines during the smallpox epidemic? Because this has been a real issue in the current pandemic where physicians, nurses, and other, other people frequently feel they should not have to put themselves at unnecessary risk wow. those who refuse to get vaccinated. Are there historic cat corollaries for this? <sighs> Well, the, the, the closest answer I've got for you, and so, so I'd say um, I, I didn't uh, read, so doctors tended to be extremely angry about um, people who refused to get vaccinated, right, as you would expect. Um, I did not read about refusal of treatment uh, for smallpox, uh, uh, people inflicted with smallpox. Um, but there is one a famous episode from Boston in during the 1901-1902 epidemics where a prominent anti-vaccinationist uh, and a um, prominent health, local health official got into what was essentially a, um, a, 
comp, you know, comp, contest uh, to test their various points of view. And the health official actually said, okay, well, if you don't think that smallpox is real and that smallpox vaccines can be effective, come on out and visit uh, the island where we have our, our currently have our pest house. And I'll introduce you to some people with smallpox. Uh, and this, this uh, Emmanuel Pfeiffer, the, the anti-vaccinationist, made the trip out on the boat, met a, a doctor, I think it was Samuel Durgin was his name, and, um, and uh, toured the facility, uh, inhaled the breath of uh, at least one smallpox patient, and went off and got a very serious case of smallpox. He survived, but barely. Uh, and just, I think, the, the, the fact that, that, that this epidemic and anti-vaccination arguments during it could, could cause a health official to have that level of frustration uh, that he would actually engage in such a sort of public spectacle that risked, uh, that nearly killed an individual is, uh, uh, you know, I think says something about, um, that relates to the question, but, um, but I, don't, I don't really have the evidence of particular examples of folks refusing to treat the unvaccinated. So we have two additional questions and I think that'll probably be it. Have the legal decisions of the first decade of the 20th century been used or referred to in the current opinions? Mm. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I really appreciate this question. So when the Jacobson was a, um, until fairly recent, recently, Jacobson was not a well-known case, but it had had a real impact on American constitutional law. Most famously, it was the only case cited as precedent by uh, the uh, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in Buck versus Bell, which upheld in 1927 the constitutionality of eugenical sterilization laws. Um, and it, and it, Jacobson, as a case, had a sort of long afterlife in opinions involving, uh, you know, dire circumstances and when the authorities can use uh, sort of ex extreme, uh, extreme force or extreme compulsion. When the um, uh, pandemic broke out, uh, the, the COVID pandemic broke out, and state and local governments started to respond using police powers to uh, to in institute lockdowns and to um, uh, keep you know people at home or to quarantine and so on. Um, and those were challenged. Those uh, the state level courts looked at Jacobson, brought Jacobson back. Uh, what the Supreme Court has done though is to try to work around Jacobson because it's such a strong precedent in favor of public health authority during an epidemic. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the, the way that they're able to do that really in particular is because um, the most, the strongest vaccine mandates have been instituted at the federal level. So they don't need to talk about the rights of the powers of states. They need, they're talking about the power of the federal government and then they're, they're examining uh, the OSHA ruling through the perspective of administrative law and workplace regulations at the federal level, rather than thinking of it in this longer tradition. Um, and I think that has to do with how this predict particular court wanted to rule on that particular um, case. We actually have several other interesting questions. Do you have time to stay on for a bit longer? Oh, absolutely. I, I think I spoke for too long, and so I, I'd be delighted to uh, right. engage any questions. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that anyone in this country at one point consented to a vaccine which left a permanent scar on their bodies. I can't imagine that the COVID vaccine would have gotten very far if it meant a permanent scar. What do you think has changed in our country and society that has resulted in this transformation? Oh my gosh. I've actually never, I've never thought about that. Um, but well, first of all, it's it's really kind of a remarkable historical thing, right? The the, um, the the smallpox vaccine scar on the upper arm. I mean, this was uh, omnipresent uh, in in our or almost in our uh, society until uh, the the well the practice through until the seventies, and then um, folks typically had them. I should have one. I can't 
well, I can't see a sign of it, but I, if I didn't, if I don't, then my parents were negligent and not getting vaccinated. Um, I think, no, but I re seem to recall the, getting the vaccine at the time. Um, why are we so, the, the point of the question though is, you know, why are folks today seemingly uh, so much more uh, sensitive to um, any uh, kind of, um, any, any government action that would mark their bodies. Um, I, it's just a great point that I haven't really, I don't really have a, an answer to, It'd be purely speculative. One thing I will say though, is that folks who lived in the late 19th and early 20th century, they were used to just a world of everyday pain and suffering that we just don't know. Uh, most, most of us have, uh, don't have to experience industrial accidents in an era before workers' compensation laws. Um, and, and all kinds of ailments and sicknesses, which is why in the South, when, uh, when variola minor first appeared, people just didn't take it that seriously because they'd seen so much worse um, than this milder form of smallpox. Great question. I just wanna say, I, I wish I had a better answer. Thank you. Given the success of science and the rise of industry at that time, why were, efforts to use these examples not trusted by the anti-vaxxers? Um, so yes, yeah, science uh, was certainly in ascendance uh, during the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, the germ theory was beginning to uh, really kind of take hold and, and gain, gain wider acceptance. Um, but no, no one had ever, no scientist had been able to isolate the smallpox virus, right? It's too small it, until the invention of the electron microscope. No one knew exactly what caused, um, caused smallpox. Um, but the medical beliefs of, of people back then were really, really complicated. Uh, a lot of folks in the, who were va vaccination, uh, anti-vaccination leaders really believed very strongly in natural healing and, and uh, uh, um, different forms of, of, of cures than, uh, than um, allopathic medicine. Um, and they viewed the rise of state licensing uh, as a, a real intrusion upon freedom of conscience of medical practitioners, as well as uh, the people who received uh, uh, medical treatments. Um, and, uh, and the trust factor about science, just remember that these vaccines were not being produced the way they are today uh, in a system which of heavy regulation and there was no compensation law in, in, in place or anything like that. Um, so they were uh, being asked to take uh, into their body uh, vaccines that have been produced um, in uh, the stable and laboratory setting that had never been inspected, never been examined uh, by any government official no one uh, could, could ensure that they were safe or effective. Um, so I, I think that there, was, there, were, there were reasons. Given what you know about vaccine mandates in our culture, what advice do you have for the current vaccination efforts? How has the COVID vaccination program been different from others such as measles, mumps, rubella, and so forth? Hmm. Social media has energized the anti-vax movement. Is there a way to deal with this and use it to promote vaccination? Yeah, I, re I read a, uh, um, a uh, I don't want to be irresponsible and not get the story right. Um, there, there is a, you know, there, there have been real publicity efforts, right? There have been real social media efforts. There have been efforts to mobilize um, the institutions of civil society, voluntary associations, churches, religious groups, um, uh, mobilize our celebrities, right, to, to counter the anti-vaccination uh, arguments of a few uh, former celebrities. Um, and I, I think that, you know, this effort at persuasion has been robust and should continue to be robust. Um, it's the best, it's our best, uh, um, our best kind of hope for getting more people uh, vaccinated against uh, COVID-19? Uh, the answer is not, you know, heavy compulsion, that's for sure. Um, although uh, I, I don't consider uh, what what President Biden put forward to be heavy compulsion. Um, 
So yes, messaging is really, really, really important. Uh, I would I would talk a lot about uh, the extent to which which uh, the um, COVID vaccine has vaccines have been safe, right? That that they've they've really been effective. They've kept people out of hospitals, kept people from dying, um, and uh, uh, and they've they've done so in quite a safe safe manner. And that's the message that just keeps has to keep getting put out there. So I think the last question will be. When I started school in 1948, we all docilely lined up to have our smallpox vaccination scar confirmed. I don't recall any objection from anyone. Has the mm -hmm. widespread objection to vaccination, has, has the widespread vac objection to vaccination waxed and waned over time? What social factors might have affected that? For example, Re yeah. freedom with responsibility was widely, freedom with responsibility was widely promoted when I was growing up. Yeah, yeah, and and in that moment, 1948, right? This was um, a uh, a post-war moment, right? When Americans had really grown um, accustomed to extraordinary sacrifices for uh, the general welfare, um, and when smallpox uh, uh, broke out in uh, New York in 1947, just a year before uh, the um, the story told by the question asker, um, people lined up to get vaccinated. Uh, no one wanted smallpox, and uh, but there was also a sense of uh, a, a general sense of social responsibility um, uh, in the post-war moment. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilrich. This is a great talk. I appreciate it. It will oh, be thanks. available online. Uh, at the bml.org website shortly. Thank Thanks you. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all.